Good morning, Interweb. World Builders Log 28. We are continuing to build out our planet here, placeholder name Kretak. And in this video, we're going to start down the road to getting our climate zones marked in. Beginning that process today with marking in our ocean currents with a side helping of winds and sea ice, thrown in just for good measure. Before we start, let's just list some sources. Primarily, I'm going to be following World Building Pasta's excellent climate building guide. Now, World Building Pasta relies very heavily on simulating climate, which is a thing I don't want to do here. I'd like to go for a more accessible by hand approach. So we're going to supplement his methodology with that of fantasy author and YouTube extraordinaire Madeline James Wrights. If you don't know who this person is, you're in for a treat. She has an absolutely excellent sort of by hand analog world building guide. Highly, highly recommend. Also, 1.3K subscribers is criminal given the quality of content she puts out there. So please, please, please go over and show her some love. Okay, so now before we mark in ocean currents, it would behoove us to understand a little bit about how they work. So science lesson engaged. So on an Earth-like planet, your ocean currents are gonna look something like this. That is assuming that your Earth-like planet spins at relatively the same rate as Earth and in the same direction as Earth. What's being depicted here are surface wind-driven currents. Because they're wind-driven, we need to understand how the winds work on an Earth-like planet. And again, assuming a similar rotation rate and direction, the winds on your fantasy world should look a little bit like this, albeit this is a very idealized model. At or near the equator, you're going to get an intertropical convergence zone, aka the ITCZ, aka the doldrums. At about 30 degrees north and south, you're going to get your subtropic highs, aka the horse latitudes. And at about 60 degrees north and south, you're going to get your subpolar lows, aka the polar front. Low pressure zones are wet, high pressure zones are dry, and temperature drops off as you go poleward. So the ITCZ is hot and wet, the horse latitudes are warm and dry, the polar front is like cool and moist, and up near the tippy top here, conditions are cold and dry. Now we're called that warm air rises and cool air sinks. So it's warmest at the intertropical convergence zone, warm air rises there up to a given altitude, splits, heads polewards, cooling and eventually sinking to form the horse latitudes. And then the air blows back along the ground to close up this loop, a loop that we call the Hadley cell. Same shtick occurs up in the polar cell. Relatively warm air rises at the polar front, up to a given altitude, travels poleward, cools, dries, sinks, and travels back along the ground. Ditto for the feral cell. Now, because Earth-like planets will be spinning, these surface winds here will never just travel north to south directly. They're going to be deflected due to the spin and the Coriolis force. In the tropics, these surface winds will be deflected to the west. So obviously, we call them easterlies, which is just really annoying, but they're given that name because they blow from the east. Again, same deal up in the polar cell you get the polar easterlies. And in the feral cell, the surface winds are deflected to the east. So again, we call them westerlies because they blow from the west. Once you got that grokked, it's pretty easy to see how these circulation cells in the ocean come about. At or near the equator, currents flow in general to the west because they are blown thusly by the easterlies, AKA the trade winds. They keep on bopping along until they hit some land at which point they split, heading poleward in both hemispheres. They continue to head poleward until like midway through the feral cell, where the westerlies dominate, so the current gets blown to the east. Until it meets some land again, splits, one branch heads poleward, one branch heads equatorward, to close up this loop known as a gyre. And you'll see this pattern repeat itself all over the place. Same mechanism at play. Currents shown in black here, are kind of like neutral currents. They're not transferring much heat. Currents shown in red are warm currents, transferring heat from warmer latitudes into colder latitudes. And currents shown in blue here are cold currents, transferring colder waters into warmer latitudes. An important thing to note about all these gyres here is that they form a logical system of like revolving units. So like nowhere on the planet does water go into a space and not come back out. Everything has to kind of like hook up correctly, which hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate to you as we draw them in later. 
Now, finally, you might be asking, well, who cares? Do we even need to mark in ocean currents? They can't be that important, right? And the answer is, yes, they are very important. One, they help us determine climate zones because they show us how heat transfers around the globe and heat plays a role in climate zone placement. Two, they give us shipping lanes. So we have an idea how people might move through the oceans. And three, we're not going to touch on this video, but it'll come up later. They'll also help us track where good fishing areas are, where very productive areas are. And so by extension, might help us track where we might put thriving civilizations. So ocean currents, a step not to be skipped. Over to Blender, we pop and let's prep this for drawing. The basics of setting up your file here are covered in episode 25, links in usual places. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna skip through all the old information. So in addition to our base map layer here, we're gonna to need to make six additional layers. Here's what to name them, and we're gonna place them in this order. So to make a layer, shift A, search, image texture, new, name your layer, starting with, in this case, summer sea ice. Height and width is that of your base map. In my case, that's 5,000 by 2,500. Color, make sure you take the, make sure you click on the color, take the alpha down to zero and make sure alpha is checked and then hit okay. And to save space, twiddle down this little arrow here. Excellent. Rinse and repeat and it'll look something like this. Next, we need to hook these all up. So we have to go shift A, search, mix, change float to color. And then this is really important. You gotta do this in this precise order. Starting with your base map, take the yellow node and put it into A. On your next layer down, take the yellow node and put it into B. And then from that same layer, take the gray node and put it into factor. Then collapse this and put it right next to this layer. Now these two layers are hooked up. So we're gonna repeat this process. Shift A, search, mix, float, color. And this time we take the output of the mix node, this yellow node here, put it into A. We go down to our next layer, take the yellow node, put it into B. And from that same layer, take the gray node and put it into factor and then collapse and move this beside your new layer. Repeat this process for each of the layers, like so, and then take the final node of your final layer, run it into color in emissions, and you may as well just collapse these down just to make everything all nice and neat. We're doing all this malarkey here purely just to have a bunch of transparent layers upon which we can draw. And if at any time we want to hide one of these layers, make it invisible, we just go to the mix node beside the layer we want to make invisible, click on it, hit M to turn it off and hit M again to turn it back on, which is really handy. And the final thing, if we go over to texture paint here, let me just zoom this fella out. There we go. Scroll down to the bottom here. Be really careful. The cursor should change. Mine's giant. This is difficult. Come on, where are you? Click and drag up to to put in like a new workspace, I guess. Head on over to Paint Bucket tool here in the corner, click down and change this to Shader Editor, just so we can have our layers visible here in case we want to toggle visibility and we don't want to be, you know, changing tabs to do this. Okay, no globe, no worries. Go over to the top here, click, beautiful. Oh, and the reason why we have summer and winter versions for each of these layers is that we're going to basically create two maps of everything, one for summer and one for winter, because conditions change over the course of a year and tracking this will allow us to um, bring seasonal variability into our climate mapping. Also note that when I say summer and winter here, I'm talking with respect to the Northern Hemisphere. So summer ocean currents means the ocean currents when it's Northern Hemisphere summer. And I'm defining north as just being top of the screen here, just so we're all orientated. Okay, step one. Okay, so we are gonna start this process by marking in our ITCZ when it's Northern Hemisphere summer. So make sure you go over here to the sidebar and have the screwdriver and wrench tab clicked. Scroll down to summer wind patterns and select that just to make sure you're drawing on the correct layer. Get yourself a nice big brush, strength 0.5, color blue, because the ITC is wet, blue, wet, you get the deal. Now, unfortunately for us, the ITCZ is not a neat line running across the equator. It actually looks more like this. The red here is what it's doing in Northern Hemisphere summer. Blue here is what the ITCZ is doing in Southern Hemisphere summer. 
Now, without simulating things, it's like really difficult to accurately place this. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some guidelines, some loose guidelines based off what the Earth is doing, namely these. Basically, the ITCC stays close-ish to the equator over oceans, and it moves poleward following the land in the summer hemisphere. Now, my planet is a little bit less tilted than Earth, so I think my ITCZ is going to lie a little bit more equatorward over oceans and a little bit less poleward over land masses. So, let's mark that in. Back to Blender. Start by marking in the rough location of the ITCZ in the summer hemisphere over your oceans. Something like that. Here's the 10 degree latitude mark. Five is about here, so I went a little bit less, given my lower axial tilt. Next, mark in the poleward extremes of the ITCZ over your land masses. Remember, the more expansive the land mass, the more poleward you can go. So the ITCZ is basically following the hottest parts of the planet. So as you're locating these points, try to take the morphology of the land into account. So like there's giant mountain ranges, they're going to be quite cold. So use that to adjust where you might place these markers. Again, without simulation, we're relying on just intuition. And the final thing to do is just join up all the dots. Now at this point, you might be expecting me to fill in the rest of the wind patterns, like the horse latitudes, the polar fronts, etc. But they're actually not as important for filling out ocean currents. So we're going to park those and we'll look at them in detail in a winds video. For now, the ITCC is more than sufficient to get us started with ocean currents. So change layer here to summer ocean currents, select a black thin brush and start by marking in your equatorial countercurrent. That is in every ocean, run a current that flows eastward following your doldrums or your ITCZ. Where you hit continental shelf that lies roughly perpendicular to the flow of the current, stop the current offshore. If you hit continental shelf that lies at a shallow angle with respect to the current, run this equatorial countercurrent up the coast a little bit. Cool. So once this current hits a continental shelf, and note I'm saying continental shelf here specifically, we're not just referencing land masses, we're referencing the full extent of the continental crust, even if it's submerged. Once it hits a substantial chunk of continental crust, this equatorial countercurrent is going to split and curve tightly back around. Go no more than say five to 10 degrees of latitude away from your equatorial countercurrent. Now, increase your brush size, Keep it black because these are neutral currents. They're not transferring heat across the latitudes. And from each of these splitting points we just put down, run a westward equatorial current until you meet a chunk of continental shelf. Again, going no more than about five to 10 degrees away from your equatorial countercurrent. Now switch to a red brush and where these westward equatorial currents hit continental shelf, run a poleward warm current along your coasts up until 30 degrees for now. Latitude. Okay, now it's not entirely clear as to what might happen here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stub in a little warm current here and we'll figure out its exact morphology in a bit. Also note, when I say that these currents flow along the coasts, like they don't hug the coast, like oftentimes they run several hundreds of kilometers offshore. So you don't need to worry about being too precise here. And you should bypass things like minor coastal bays or coastal seas. They don't really come into play here. So as these warm currents enter the feral cell between 30 and 60 degrees north and south, the westerlies and the Coriolis force will come to dominate and will send the currents back across the ocean to the east. Where they turn will be somewhere between 40 and 50 degrees north and south. In the summer hemisphere, stick closer to the upper range. In the winter hemisphere, stick closer to the lower range. So like if we extend this chap up along here, this is the summer hemisphere. So I'm going to continue him on to maybe midway through the cell here. I know he's going to go back across the ocean. And as it goes back across, it'll maintain a sort of poleward slant to it. So we'll continue marking it in red because it's still kind of to an extent transferring heat from warmer lower latitudes to cooler higher latitudes. 
So he'll start moving around here, maintaining a, cold, uh, a poleward bent to it. So I'm going to say at the opposite side of this ocean, because it's the summer side, he's going to approach 50 degrees here, which is maybe something like so. And then all I'm going to do is just join these two up as best I can. Something like that. So rinse and repeat. Now in this section of ocean, my currents never get up to between 40 and 50. There's land in the way. So we'll simply just follow our coastline along, stopping it on the other side of the ocean. Winter hemisphere. So I'm going to say when this chap gets to the other side of the ocean, he's going to be closer to 40. So we'll say maybe here. So he'll do something like this perhaps stopping him at this continental shelf section here here's tricky i said we're ignoring bays but that's a hell of a bay for now given the flow here i'd imagine this would continue across the ocean like so and we'll see when we do something here later. So next we'll switch to a blue color and wherever the currents we just drew in hit a substantial section of continental shelf, they'll split again, just like before, go poleward and equatorward and close up some gyres. So a couple of things here. Number one, if you have a major current, crossing across an ocean and there's a substantial landmass within about 50 degrees of latitude of it so what's that that's about 10 20 30 40 50 that's what we got here you may peel a current off this main current down to meet this landmass when it's directly north or south so something like this and it's cool obviously because it's transferring colder waters into warmer regions but also helping to inform us what to do with this chap. So he would very naturally just continue up along here, closing this guy. And the other thing is, yeah, bays, right? I said we don't worry about them at all. And you might be asking like, well, what goes on there? Are there no ocean currents in there? The reason why we're mapping out ocean currents is to do with heat transport and how this heat will affect the land and by extension, the climate zones. In terms of heat transfer, there's not much going on here. Yeah, there'll be a bunch of currents, but they'd be kind of like more minor, kind of more like eddies as opposed to these major currents. So what we say is that the bay here just inherits the kind of heat properties of the current that's flowing offshore. So like all of this section here would be like a cold current coast because there's a major cold current running offshore. And we don't care about the minor currents here, if that makes sense. Oh, and finally here, when you have these currents running kind of counter to one another, you can if you want, it's not a massive deal. You can switch to black, drop your brush size, and just indicate, you know, that there is in fact water doing this. So it's kind of like there's like a, I guess you could say it's a mini gyre. It's not really, but you can just indicate this should you wish to do so. Very good. Next up, we're going to switch to red because we have new splitting points. We've sent cold waters down into the tropics. We're now going to send warm waters up into the poles. And so we do this by peeling off a current, following again the shelf, up until about 70 to 80 degrees north and south. In the summer hemisphere, more equatorward. In the winter hemisphere, more poleward. So something a little bit like this. And now the easterlies will begin to dominate, forcing this water back across the ocean, maintaining a poleward slant to it. So I'm going to say again that maybe we reach land or continental shelf here somewhat. So we'll just join that up, trying to keep a poleward slant. Bingo. Rinse and repeat. I'll drop one in here, forming this guy, but I may come to regret that. I'll have to go away and think about that. Okay, and then we switch to blue and we close up our gyres.
And finally, the poles. If you have an open ocean at the poles, switch to black and mark in a circumpolar current flowing westward. And again, this is a neutral current because it's not really traversing the latitudes. So that's why we're marking in black and it's not doing a whole lot in terms of heat transfer. And also it's probably going to be hidden in a second, something like that. Now, what that will help us do is figure out the weirdness of this ocean here. So this water is like looping around like so. It's going to be affected by the continental shelf here and be sent polewards. It's going to be a cold current. So it would likely do something like this, I guess. Now that is 40 to 50 here, which is where currents got blown westward, which means that we'd expect some sort of, I'm just sketching here, I'm not switching colors. We'd expect some sort of, and it's in the summer hemisphere. So over here, it's going to get quite northerly. So we'd expect some sort of cross ocean current there, which means we'll have a split this way and this way. So this will come back around Yada. This will go up here. And this will connect up here, which is just so weird. And I'm not sure if it's correct because we have this like tiny little dwarf gyre. And it's occurring because ordinarily this gyre would continue up like so, but there's there's land in the way. Oh, I don't know if I like this. Part of me, part of me thinks, and here's where you kind of like break away from patterns and begin to kind of like intuit stuff. Part of me thinks that, again, we're dealing with abstraction here. So what's going to happen, you know, along each of these currents, like constantly bits of water are going to be peeling off, right? So if that's occurring here, you can imagine there's so much peeling off here that there may be like no room for this kind of current. So we would actually just get one giant current down here and back up, which is maybe correct. It's definitely not Earth-like because we don't have this set up on Earth. Um, so I, I might go with that. And if there are any professionals in comments, you can let me know if that is completely bananas. But I think the logic is sound. So this cold current extends down here, which we would not expect. But again, the morphology of the ocean seems to be indicating that, possibly. And then we'll switch to red to come up along here. Wow, that's so weird. Hmm, not sure how I feel about that, but hey-ho. Okay, that is, I think, ocean currents done. Correct, well, kinda. Next step, sea ice. So apologies for these images, they're, they're quite pixely. But these are the nicest I guess I could find. So, sea ice. Sea ice can be important because it is not continental shelf, but it does a pretty great job at blocking ocean currents, like continental shelf. So if we can figure out where the sea ice is, that might inform some of the morphology of our currents. And I guess vice versa. Again, without simulating things, it's super hard to tell where sea ice could go because it, it's meant to go in regions where the sea never gets above negative two degrees Celsius. Again, sand simulation, quite hard to spot. So once again, we'll eyeball Earth and we'll look for general guidelines because I construct this planet to be relatively Earth-like so I can kind of do this stuff. Also, my ocean up here is more akin to the Arctic than it is the Antarctic because there's no big continent here. So I'm just going to look at what's going on here. This is sea ice in winter and this is sea ice in summer, broadly speaking. And from this, we can draw these general sets of guidelines. Basically, the bulk of the sea ice exists between 70 and 80 degrees north and south. In the summer, closer to 80. In the winter, closer to 70. Along eastern coasts, so that's coasts with cold currents, you can extend the sea ice down to about 45 degrees north and south, but really only as a thin strip along the coasts. You don't even need to mark that last bit in, because in terms of blocking ocean currents and the like, it's not going to do a whole lot, given how coastal it is. So, with those guidelines set, let's see what we can do. I'm going to switch over to Summer Sea Ice. Again, be pedantic about your layers. Going to select a white brush for obvious reasons. We're in the Summer Hemisphere here, so just 80 degrees north, which is here and up, or poleward, should I say. I'm just going to color in. I'm also just going to extend this down to the coasts for no other reason than it just kind of feels right. 
And if you note here, there's a big cutaway in the sea ice here. I suspect, though I could be wrong, this is because of the Norwegian current part of the Gulf Stream, as in warm water is coming across here and up into here, thus limiting the spread of sea ice, I think. So I'm gonna mimic this here. Again, someone let me know if this is completely off base. So we have this warm current here. So I suspect it could maybe eat into the sea ice a little bit. And maybe along these colder coasts, sea ice can prevail. But I'm not gonna go more than 70, so maybe something like that. And along here, we have this big kind of trans-ocean current here. And I'm kind of thinking of this as being like what's going on in the Antarctic, like kind of circumpolar currents that like limit the spread of sea ice around Antarctica. So we'll say that this guy corrals the sea ice, so it's not gonna go down any further. Something like that, tentatively. So I'm just gonna edit the currents to show what's blocked and what's not. Okay, something like that. There obviously still will be currents kind of below the sea ice, I guess, but we're just not gonna mark them in. And let's not forget about the other hemisphere. Okay, cool. So winter hemisphere, we're gonna go closer to 70. The Literally the only bit of open ocean, well, I say open ocean, water we'll say, in that range between 70 and 80 is this little chunk here. So we're gonna have basically no sea ice functionally. So it's gonna be all along here perhaps and that's kind of it and certainly it's doing no current blocking so we're cool there okay so that is ocean currents done at least for northern hemisphere summer what we do now is you would go ahead and do the exact same thing but for when the northern hemisphere is in winter i won't do this now just to save a bit of time i'll do it off air and show you at the start of the next video what I do want to talk about now are ENSO events. That's E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation Events. Hi everyone, sorry, Future Edgar here. I decided to, in fact, go ahead and mark in all of the winter ocean patterns. Here they are. A little bit hard to see in 3D, the comparison between the seasons. So let's switch over to 2D. Here is the state of play in Northern Hemisphere summer. And here it is in Northern Hemisphere winter. Summer winter, summer, winter. And incidentally, this weird chunk of ocean here that we were pondering over earlier, it's definitely gonna have this cold current going the whole way down in winter. So that could mean that in summer, where we were debating having this little mini gyre, it could mean we have like a seasonal gyre that only crops up depending on the season, which again, like hella weird, and I don't think happens on a really meaningful scale on earth, which is, cool but also you know at the same time worrying because like what do you do there like i said i'll go away and think about it we'll figure something out anyways back to enzo events these occur along equatorial oceans that are landlocked to the west and the east and probably also either the north or the south and these regions would experience a sort of switch an oscillation between different climate extremes going from really wet to really dry on kind of very macro cycles. So not seasonally, but across many years, like three, four, five years at a time. So what I'm gonna do is try and locate where this effect would be the strongest. So first step I usually do is look for my, the widest expanse of equatorial ocean, which is probably here, but it's not incredibly landlocked along this side. I wonder, nor is that, I wonder would this be the one? So we're landlocked here, we're landlocked here, we're landlocked up above. Maybe this might be where the effect is the strongest, possibly, even though it's a relatively small ocean. Hmm. Let's go for it for now. I'm just going to put a dot here on either side just to indicate to me that the dipole is occurring here. It, it's also called a dipole. So what will happen is during a positive phase, the currents and the winds will kind of act as we've like depicted here lots of warm water will be forced over here, given the directions of the currents, warm water, low pressure, lots of rain. So we have relative abundance going on here. And conversely over here, all the warm water has been vacated. Upwelling occurs, we'll talk about it later. Get a bunch of cold water, cold water, cold temperatures, high pressure, drought. So abundance, 
drought during a positive phase of the cycle. And then for complicated reasons I do not want to get into, this cycle can switch, where a bunch of warm water now pools over on this side. Warm water, low pressure, lots of rain, so we get lots of abundance here. At the same time, here we'll have cold water, high pressure, dry conditions, drought. And you see this effect on Earth between South America and Australia, where this switch occurs on these macro cycles. Hence, Enzo event, El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's the oscillation that occurs between South America and Australia. This is a subtle effect. It won't play a huge role in determining climate zones, but it would play a huge role in terms of culture, obviously. And just to be clear, this would affect, well, maybe not here, but this would affect all the oceans, but we're kind of only worried about where the effect would be strongest, which again, I believe is here. If not here, probably here. Again, I'll think about it. Okay. Is that this video done? I think that's this video done. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. Stay safe and until next time. Oh, by the way, check out World Building Past and Madeline James Wright's links in the description. Edgar Elves. <laughs>